There's a strange little story placed right in the middle of the East Blue Saga, starring Oda's favourite character when asked in 2001 aside from Luffy. A story completely cut from the live action and moved and changed in the anime. The shortest story in One Piece, the story of a man stuck in a treasure chest for 20 years, the story of Gaimon. If you haven't seen my last video, in it I outlined that One Piece was originally planned to be less than around 150 chapters long, and that every single chapter counts. So a whole chapter dedicated to a story where no new crew member is recruited, no big villain is introduced, and where seemingly there doesn't appear to be any long-term ramifications to the story, it makes me ask the question, what is the point of East Blue? Because Gaimon's story is so short, after we get through it, I'm going to point out some things I've noticed from the last few arcs that didn't make it into the previous parts for one reason or another, normally because I noticed it during editing. With that covered, let's get into the story of Gaimon. Before our trio reached the island of strange creatures, there's a nice short scene where Nami fixes Luffy's hat, only for him to poke another hole in it shortly after, Nami stabs Luffy with a needle in retaliation, Luffy and Zoro convince Nami to share her food with them, and then after they see an island, Zoro and Luffy ignore Nami and row towards it. There's a few things to notice in this prelude. First, it's Luffy's trust of Nami. He's letting Nami handle his hat. Remember last arc as someone tried to touch it, and Luffy wasn't so keen on that. Even though Nami hasn't agreed to join Luffy's crew yet, Luffy is trusting her with his treasure, at least to repair it. Nami stabbing Luffy with a needle is also pretty cute. It's also something that retrospectively is of note. As a first time reader, you can pick up that Nami is pretty considered in her actions. If you were reacting without thinking, you'd probably just hit Luffy, but Nami makes sure to stab him because she knows hitting him won't do anything. I mean, Luffy even agrees with her. In retrospect, this scene is of note because in the future, Nami can and does injure Luffy with just her fists. So much so that there's jokes and even theories about how and why. I'm going to keep an eye out to see exactly when she gains this ability, but at least for now, she doesn't have it. Finally, we see the difference of experience between Luffy and Zoro and Nami. Nami knows how to survive at sea. She knows what is needed to survive. She's able to judge an island's usefulness at a glance. She's also able to sew, shown when she repairs Luffy's hat. She has a wide set of skills. That's why she's able to survive at sea operating by herself. Zoro and Luffy are limited in their abilities. They're pretty much just surviving on Luffy luck and little else. They really need Nami. She even wonders how on earth they're still alive. They reach the island and Zoro taps out for the chapter and the story proper begins. You can see the beginnings of a common Oda arc introduction structure here, and it's really fun. Luffy and crew arrive at an island and sometimes Luffy drags his crew to an island because adventure. They explore, there's something that makes the island unique, then the plot starts to happen. In this case, it's Luffy and Nami, they arrive at what they think is a deserted island, but wait. The animals here seem to be strange half and half creatures, and then the guardian of the forest speaks out to them, warning them not to proceed any further. Of course, Luffy couldn't care less about anyone or anything telling him not to adventure, so he ignores the voice and continues onward and gets shot in the back. And boy, wasn't that fortunate. I mean, Luffy is thankfully immune to bullets, as Nami now learns, but if Gaimon aimed for Nami, well, that wouldn't have been too good. But yes, the guardian of the forest is revealed to be Gaimon, a man who 20 years ago got his body stuck in an empty treasure chest and has been stuck that way on the island ever since. He has truly become one with the treasure, his whole identity now entwined with a treasure chest. I wonder if that's symbolic. Their conversation takes a turn as Luffy mentions the One Piece and the Grand Line, and for the first time we see the world. Yep, it's hard to remember, but this is the first time we see the world of One Piece in this single chapter story about a man stuck in a chest. Nami describes the world in a way that's perhaps a little outdated. First she says the world has two oceans or two seas, and then she says there's a town at the center of the red line, which, I mean, she's not talking about Fishman Island, so she's not entirely correct, but it goes to show that to even a skilled navigator and someone who will later learn is big into maps and cartography, she doesn't fully understand the nature of the Grand Line. At least we'll discover that in retrospect. Now, as mentioned, Gaimon has been stuck on this island for 20 years, but he was a pirate before that, and we learn that the Great Age of Pirates has been happening for 20-something years, so we can gleam a few things from this revelation. Number one, the King of the Pirates was executed somewhere between 20 and 30 years ago. Two, 
Even 20 years ago, early into the era of piracy, the Grand Line was still known as the Pirate's Graveyard and a place of horror. So it's not due to the Great Pirate Era flooding the Grand Line with pirates that it became the place that it is, it has always been that place. Three, we actually learn what the Grand Line is. Everyone's been describing the Grand Line as a place, but now we know it's a sea route. One that, when looking at the world map, runs perpendicular to the Red Line and circles around the entire world. Oh yeah, we also learn about the Red Line. Of course, none of this information phases Luffy in the slightest. He's all like, I'm lucky, we're good. And I mean, yeah, Luffy is very lucky. There's a whole movie based around him being canonically really lucky. But Luffy's confidence makes Gaimon realize that the two of them share something in common. Hope. Or really, belief. Luffy believes, really truly believes, let's forget his early moment of introspection back in chapter 2, that he'll find the One Piece. That's why it's not his dream, it's just a checklist item, a grand adventure that he's confident he will succeed at. That's why he doesn't proclaim, I'll try to be King of the Pirates, or I'll do my best to be Pirate King. It's always the affirmative, I'm gonna be the King of the Pirates. Gaiman's hope isn't so grand, but he does believe in something. So we go back into his flashback, where we find out his, well, when you think about it, actually quite tragic backstory. And hey, wait a minute. Gaimon, you liar, you said you used to have two eyebrows. Anyway, first I'd like to point out that unlike someone like Buggy, who found treasure and tried to keep it to himself, Gaimon legitimately did try to share the treasure with his crewmates. If anything, it's kind of rotten of them to just leave him there. I mean, the island doesn't seem all that large and his captain was just there. I reckon they could have found him, but nevertheless, Gaimon falls after catching a glimpse of the treasure chests and lands in the empty chest that his captain had found earlier and gets stuck. On one hand, now he's alone, the treasure is his, and on the other hand, he can no longer climb to the treasure because of his predicament. And now his desire for a treasure that is out of his reach consumes him for 20 years. He drives away pirates, fearing that they will find the treasure that's rightfully his. Hell, he would have killed Luffy if he wasn't a rubber man, and then he'd still be stuck all alone on the island, pining after a treasure he could never reach, but he believes that it's there. Even after 20 years, even though the only other chest they found was empty, there is a treasure up there. Gaiman just knows it. Thankfully, Luffy is a good guy, and hearing Gaiman's story, he agrees. Yep, it's Gaiman's treasure, and then Nami offers to get the treasure for him, and not with the intention to steal it either. Of course, she makes Luffy retrieve the treasure, and he launches himself up there with ease. He confirms the existence of the chests, Gaiman celebrates and tells Luffy to throw him down, and... Just look at this expression. It's amazing what a few minor details can do. The slight shadow under the eye, the tiny sweat drop, the line at the corner of the mouth. Luffy is panicking. He doesn't know what to do. He can't bear to reveal to Gaimon that his last 20 years of hoping have all been for nothing. He can't reveal that the chests are empty, so all he can do is just refuse to bring the chest down. Play the villain, let Gaimon stay ignorant. But Gaimon knows. And he knows that Luffy is just trying to protect him. He doesn't blame Luffy, but even as he justifies it to himself, he just breaks down. Well, now Luffy bursts out laughing. He's found his solution. If the treasure was a bust, you better come find the One Piece with us, the greatest treasure of all. He invites Gaimon to join his crew. Luffy is great, isn't he? It wouldn't be a stretch to say that getting this treasure has been Gaimon's dream, his purpose, and when Luffy is confronted by the shattering of this strange little chess man's dream right in front of his eyes, his solution is to dream bigger. In other stories, the reveal that that thing you've believed in is a lie would be the end. The moral of the story would be that even if it hurts, even if it stinks, learning the truth about something is the real reward, but not in One Piece, not for Luffy. If you can't achieve something, if what you believed in is false, then you don't give up. You set your sights even higher. Gaimon, in the end, turns Luffy down. All those strange animals that were shown at the start of the story, well, it ends up after 20 years, Gaimon is quite fond of them, and their uniqueness makes them a hot commodity, so he decides to stay to protect them. And now liberated from his self-imposed guardianship of the treasure that doesn't exist, he can live his life and actually enjoy it for what it is. He wishes Luffy and Nami well, and we see one more shot of Zoro fast asleep, and the final shot is of him surrounded by the island's strange creatures as the trio sail off into the horizon. I'm going to quickly brush over characters and world building since I kind of covered them in the flow of the story recap. Character wise, the only additional thing would be to point out that even with the potential of great treasure, Nami doesn't make any attempt at any point to try and weasel Gaimon out of it. 
You could say it's a gray area as he's an ex-pirate and Nami only steals from pirates, so his treasure is off the table, but still, it goes to show that she's not the shallow treasure first person that she appeared to be on the surface if the last arc didn't already make that clear. Luffy's attempted recruitment of Gaimon shows... I'm not really sure what to call it, but his honorable side? I'm not sure Gaimon has really fulfilled Luffy's good guy criteria, but Luffy feels obliged to invite him to his crew. He's taking responsibility for having revealed the truth to Gaimon in the only way he can. It reminds me a little bit of when Robin joins the crew, and he more or less just takes her in as an act of obligation, though that said, I'm not up to that part just yet, so maybe I'll find more nuance when I cover it in depth. World building wise, aside from all the stuff revealed about the world, the Grand Line, the Great Pirate Era, the Red Line, and so on, not to belittle those things, reveals like that could justify a chapter all on its own, the island's strange creatures are also a hint of what is to come. Giant sea serpents, giant birds, a lion, all these creatures are within the realms of the expected. But now Oda's introducing us to weird and wild animals, and trust me, they'll only get stranger from here. Oh, and there's six chests on this island. Six empty chests on an island. So, no, it's not God Valley. I know I had to mention it, otherwise someone else would. We see both islands and how they look, and God Valley was in the West Blue. All right, now let's talk about themes, the juicy part of this chapter. First, Gaimon being stuck in a chest. I mentioned it before, but I reckon that's a very intentional choice. His body has literally grown into and molded itself into an empty treasure chest. An empty treasure chest has literally defined his life for the last 20 years, controlled the way that he acts and interacts with others. I like that by the end of the story, Gaimon isn't freed from the chest, even though he's been freed from his mental prison of pining after the treasure. While it would have been the easy symbolic gesture to be all, Ah oh yes, once he was freed from the mental prison caused by the treasure chests, he got freed from the physical prison of the treasure chest. But not being freed, in my opinion, is better. Because, yeah, he can't just erase those 20 years from his life. Those 20 years have, literally, molded him into the person he is today. He may no longer be burdened by the treasure, but he has been shaped by it. If not for those chests up on the cliff, he wouldn't have become fond of the strange animals around him. Or maybe I'm just putting a bit too much meaning behind a goofy character design. The chapter is also a good bookend to the Orange Town arc. While Buggy was so treasure obsessed that it caused his downfall, in Gaimon we see someone who lets go of his desire for material treasure and instead finds that the other animals are the actual treasure that the island holds. It's almost like a recovery process, the loneliness of the pursuit of material wealth versus finding your treasure outside of gold and jewels. I also noticed that aside from that one joke frame where Gaimon and Luffy both laugh at not being able to read maps, Gaimon doesn't smile until he believes the treasure chests are in his grasp. But by the end of the chapter, he's smiling in almost every frame, especially in his final farewell. Of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention the Luffy liberation loop. Though this is one of our first purely mental liberations, which is another way that this chapter justifies its existence. Previously, Luffy liberated people from literal oppressors, and while there was a mental component to his liberation of someone like Kobe by giving him the confidence to pursue his dream, Gaiman is all about liberating his mind, freeing Gaimon from the mental shackles of having to guard a treasure that didn't exist, that was causing him not to be able to enjoy his life, and liberate him from that and give him new purpose. Finally, let's talk about the elephant in the room. One Piece has been going on for 25 years, that's five years longer than Gaimon was stuck in the chest, and Gaimon found out that his treasure was empty. So, I mean, Oda knew what the One Piece is going to be, so I don't know. Oda has said in interviews that there will be a treasure. Well, that at least the One Piece is a physical thing, not something like the friends we made along the way. But I think this chapter is foreshadowing that it won't be gold and jewels. In Gaimon's story, the real treasure, so to speak, were the weird and wonderful creatures of the island. So what will the One Piece be? A bottle of sake, a story about a strange boy who brings laughter, a big red button that says, press this to destroy the red line. I think Oda is warning us here to not get trapped in an empty treasure chest. Don't get molded by an expectation that may not be fulfilled. Don't commit so hard to something that you haven't seen yet that you end up disappointed. Maybe, just maybe, a silly rubber man will show up and give you the opportunity to pursue something greater. Though, that being said, 
Gaimon says that it happens all the time that somebody's already taken the loot, and that could be foreshadowing that any one of Luffy's other rivals is going to get to the One Piece before Luffy does. I mean, it could be possible the latest chapters make it seem like it's anyone's game. Is somebody going to get to the One Piece before Luffy? I don't know what this means. Did he plan this far in advance? Curse you, Oda! Alrighty, that's the chapter done. Time to cover things I've picked up during editing. The words used when Luffy acknowledges Kobe's willingness to die to defeat the corrupt marines is good guy. I think that this is the moment where Luffy would be happy to have Kobe as a crew member. It's literally his requirement. But obviously because Kobe's dream is to become a marine, Luffy doesn't invite him. We only ever see Zoro with his bandana on for the entirety of his recruitment process. But once he's acknowledged Luffy as his captain and Morgans is defeated, we see him in the next scene without it, and also smiling and relaxed. It's an introduction to business Zoro versus relaxed Zoro. It's a fun way to tell if Zoro is taking a fight seriously, he puts on his bandana. I guess I didn't mention it, but it's interesting that Zoro uses three katanas. We've seen a fair few swords at this point, but only Zoro, so far, uses a distinctly Japanese style blade. Most other pirates use larger, more cutlass style swords. Put this one in the small details that may or may not have ramifications later on. Or I could be quickly disproven, who knows. Throughout Zoro's flashback, he's only ever using two swords. It's only once he inherits Kuina's sword and her will that he starts using three. To me, it shows that it's not Kuina's will overtaking Zoro's or replacing his own, it's additive. Zoro and Kuina's will together will be what makes Zoro the world's greatest swordsman. When Kobe says that finding the One Piece is the goal of every pirate, it makes us wonder, why did Shanks never mention it? You'd think in the opening chapter of a story called One Piece that the series' namesake would serve as an inspiration to Luffy. But, as will become apparent later, finding the One Piece for Luffy may be a fun adventure, but it's also a necessity for him to become the King of the Pirates, which is a goal that he needs to achieve in order to pursue his true, yet undisclosed dream. And remember, Shanks did not mention the One Piece at all. Devil Fruit, Fruit of the Gum Gum Tree, Fruit of the Devil Tree. What's up with that? It's kind of neat that no one that we have come across really understands what Devil Fruit are, that it's clouded where Devil Fruit come from. It even happens again in this chapter. Gaiman calls Luffy's fruit the fruit of the gum gum tree. Are there individual trees for individual powers? Is there one tree with lots of Devil Fruit on them? Who knows? Well, maybe Shanks does. He calls it the fruit of the devil. It's one of the secret treasures of the sea. I'm thinking Shanks has a pretty good idea of what Devil Fruits actually are. I totally didn't catch during the last video that Nami tying up Luffy was a great foreshadow to her tying up Buggy. It showed that Nami is really fast and skilled with a rope, and that Devil Fruit uses a weak to rope? I'm kidding on that, but it's still cool to see that Nami was able to defeat, for lack of a better term, both Buggy and Luffy using the same method. I love how Nami says, darn, I couldn't help myself when she knocks out one of Buggy's crewmates to protect Luffy. It implies that it's an automatic response for Nami to rescue others, that it's part of her nature. As much as she likes to play the villain as a thief, she is also a morally righteous person through and through. We see it again soon after the whole throwaway weapon sacrifice body to save Luffy scene after, but we will also see it later in the story when she acts automatically even when it appears to be out of character. I also noticed when Luffy offers to team up with Nami, he does it on her terms, appealing to what she wants. He's already said that she's their new navigator, but he's easing her into the role by working with her for her own goals first. Clever Luffy, very clever. And finally, this is probably the biggest one. The question, what does it mean to be a captain? I'm thinking of rephrasing it to, why does the villain fail as a pirate captain? Or better, when they are against Luffy, why do they lose? I think that's why I've struggled answering both questions each video, so from now on the two questions are, what does this arc tell us about being a pirate, and why does the enemy captain fall short of Luffy? So with Alveda, she falls short because her crew just doesn't like her. Kobe betrays her, the rest of her crew don't back her up, and she just isn't strong enough, though she's the first arc villain so it's not that deep. Morgans falls short because he doesn't trust the people serving him, or rather he sees them only as tools, adding another layer to the final blow against him, as it isn't Luffy who beats him, a leader defeating another leader, but Luffy's underling. Luffy trusts and leaves the big bad to Zoro, so an underling, it's weird to use that term to describe Zoro, defeats Morgans, throwing a spanner into his rank means everything philosophy. Buggy, as I mentioned last video, doesn't get his priorities right. He gets distracted by material wealth and therefore he loses, while Luffy literally beats him into a bag of treasure and then shows himself as not worrying about treasure when he leaves his portion to the villagers. With both Alveda and Morgans, 
It's actually Morgan, isn't it? I think I've been saying Morgans like big news Morgans. It's Captain Axehand Morgan. Okay. Um, with Alveda and Morgan, it's that they abuse their crew. With Buggy, it's that he values material wealth too much and he can't focus on his role as a captain. And we'll be getting the answer for Kuro, Krieg, and Arlong soon enough too. Alright, those are the things I picked up during editing. I'm going to take a break next video. These videos are a fair bit of effort and I'm starting to fall a little behind, so I need some time to read through and make up those scripts. I hope you've been enjoying these deep dives because I do enjoy making them, and I really love reading everyone's comments. Thank you so much for the support. I couldn't do it without you, and remember, as always, it's not I attempt new things, it's we attempt new things. Thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a fruitful day.